Hello everyone, this is Michael Voris coming to you live from Church Militant from our studios here where we're going to be doing, uh, passing on some kind of unfortunate information. Uh, you can say that the church at this moment is now speeding towards schism. And we're not talking about the German bishops. We're talking about the other end of the spectrum, the uh, what you might term radical traditionalists. What we are talking about is a... Uh, uh, an interview that was done yesterday with Bishop Athanasius Schneider about uh, disobeying the Pope and bishop priests, disobeying Pope, the Pope and their bishops, and them being perfectly legitimate doing that. Now, a little background. We here at Church Militant have interviewed Bishop Schneider, I gosh, probably four times, maybe five times. I'm not exactly certain, uh, but uh, you know, hold him in very high regard. We, we promoted and sell, currently sell, uh, his book Dominus Est on the Eucharist. We have great admiration for Bishop Schneider. Not a question about any of that. So nobody can, nobody can say, oh, you guys are this or you know, anything uh, about that. So uh, I wanna make that point clear right at the beginning. That's very important. This is not some bone we have to pick with Bishop Schneider. I've met with him quite a few times. He actually, uh, when we were in Rome one time, he actually held up his flight to go back uh, for our flight to arrive in Rome so he could speed over and do uh, an interview with him, an on-camera interview. So he's always been very gracious and very kind to us. However, that said, on this point that he is instructing priests to disobey their bishops and to disobey the Pope, uh, specifically over the question of the traditional Latin mass uh, and any restrictions that may be placed on it. He's also telling lay people uh, to, uh, you know, if you want to go buy, you know, abandoned churches or churches that are up for sale and kind of start your own thing over there. This is why we're saying speeding towards schism. Uh, Bishop Schneider has gotten some play now uh, in the last 24 hours on uh, various uh, Catholic social media sites and various organizations that support the schism, although they won't call it a schism. Uh, it is a schism. Three popes in a row have called it a schism. So to pretend it is not a schism is simply not, that's, that's not being intellectually honest. You can't say, I obey the Pope, I obey the Pope, I obey the Pope, uh, and then disobey the Pope. Uh, you also can't recognize the authority of the Pope while at the same time simply disobeying him because you think what he's doing is wrong. That's what the Protestants do. That's what the Orthodox did a thousand years ago. So guys, do we have the uh, sound ready from him yet? No, we don't? Almost. Okay, it's almost there. All right. So uh, th the point of this whole thing here is that for somebody of the personage who is as well respected in the traditional community, not just the traditional, you know, crazy, you know, wild offside, you know, the Pope isn't the Pope and he's a heretic and he's an apostate and all that crazy stuff, but just regular Latin mass going Catholics. For somebody like Bishop Schneider, uh, with the respect that he commands, deservedly so, to come out and make these kinds of comments uh, is beyond disturbing and has caused major ripples. Uh, throughout the church. So we're going to play an interview for you that he gave uh, to a fellow that uh, we can't seem to figure out who the guy is. I mean, his name's Christopher Went, but it's not important who's doing the interview. It's important what Bishop Schneider says. So guys, let's go ahead and roll that and we'll be right back in one minute. This is a, a wrong obedience towards the bishop. The bishop is here in the Pope abusing their powers for the harm of the church. And so these priests can say, I cannot obey here because I, if I will obey, I will cooperating to bring a harm, a uh, spiritual harm for the church and the souls. And in this case, the apparent disobedience is basically an obedience to the constant perpetual sense of the church, of the popes and the saints of the ages. Many people I know are starting to think about acquiring buildings to anticipate the Holy Father's further suppression of the Latin Mass. Does that make sense? Yes, I think uh, it would be meaningful uh, to do this because we don't know exactly the future. We have to be prepared inside, uh, transform it in a true church. As news of Bishop Schneider's comments now, you know, Auxiliary Bishop in uh, Kazakhstan, as the news of these comments 
a straight up call of disobedience to the Pope and uh, local bishops by their priests over the specific issue of the Latin Mass. This is now starting to spread all over the place, and we contacted a bishop. We're gonna, we agreed to keep his identity anonymous, but we would like to read you a comment that he offered to us. And this is a well-known bishop here in the United States, and he's, believe me, he's not some crazy, radical, heretic dude. We, we don't talk to them, <laughs> uh, and they don't talk to us. Uh, he said to us, the Pope is the supreme legislator. Bishop Athanasius is not. He may disagree, and here's the key point, but that doesn't give him a right to advocate disobedience. In fact, obedience is the hallmark of our confidence in the truth of the church's teachings. Better if the bishop encourage a spirituality around the TLM, traditional Latin mass, apart from any divisiveness that sometimes is a part of the rhetoric that accompanies the various criticisms. That's an excellent retort from uh, another bishop. Uh, so I think one thing that I'd like to make uh, clear to people, there, there is in the Catholic world sort of a, uh, a celebrity aura that surrounds some bishops and some priests. And many lay Catholics sort of take this approach and, and they label them holy. I don't know if somebody's holy or not. I just know I'm not. But to just lay, you put a label on somebody, oh, holy bishop, holy priest, how do you know that? Uh, but even if they are holy, doesn't mean that everything that comes out of their mouth is right. So I think we have to sort of disabuse ourselves as Catholics as this, oh, that holy bishop said this, so therefore it's right. One, you don't know he's holy, and I'm not talking about Bishop Schneider, we're talking about anybody. Uh, and two, uh, just because somebody might be holy doesn't mean they're right. So what we've asked now to get some more insight into this whole controversy that's now getting all kinds of uh, ground, we've asked uh, Michael Lofton, who is a well-known Catholic apologist, to join us live during this breaking news segment and give us his opinions and his thoughts on this. Uh, Michael, first of all, thank you very much for joining us on very short notice, M much appreciated. Uh, I gotta say, as I was listening to Bishop Schneider's uh, comments, I, I mean, these strike me as pretty dangerous. What are your thoughts? Certainly dangerous to souls, absolutely. Because what we're hearing is, under the guise of an obedience to the faith, one is to disobey the hierarchy, and that's certainly problematic. In fact, I wanna read something to you from both the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council. Let's let the church speak, the magisterium speak, and then let's maybe compare that to what we heard with Schneider. Here's what the Council of Trent says on the Pope's authority over the liturgy. It says, it furthermore declares that this power has ever been in the church, that in the dispensation of the sacraments, their substance being untouched, it may ordain or change whatever things it may judge most expedient. And then the First Vatican Council, which includes an anathema for those who deny this, goes on to say this, Wherefore we teach and declare that by divine ordinance, the Roman Church possesses a preeminence of ordinary power over every church, and that this jurisdictional power of the Roman Pontiff is both Episcopal and immediate. Here's the part. Both clergy and faithful of whatever right and dignity, both singly and collectively, are bound to submit to this power by the duty of the hierarchical subordination and true obedience. And this not only in matters concerning faith and morals, but also in which regard the discipline and government of the church, end quote. And so the point here is that, number one, the church has authority over the liturgy. So the Pope, in restricting the Missal of 62 in certain situations, perhaps we could argue it's imprudent, but he certainly has that authority according to the magisterium itself. And the church is itself saying one has to obey that, both the laity and clergy. So one can't say, well, no, you're restricting the Missal of 62, and I prefer the Missal of 62, and under the guise of obedience to the faith, I'm going to now disobey the hierarchy. The church says, absolutely not, you cannot do that. I mean, is it possible to obey the faith? Well, let, let me get to the question of disobedience. Is it possible to, to be disobedient to the hierarchy when they're not telling you to commit a sin. That's a different thing. I think we all get that. If a bishop turns to his priest and says, I, I order you under the promise you made to me and my, my successors to go rob that bank. Well, obviously that's, he's under no obligation because robbing a bank is an act of sin. Not going to the Latin mass is not a sin. So is there 
is it possible in this situation, when we're not talking about somebody being ordered to sin or commit a sin, is it mm -hmm. possible to be obedient to the faith while at the same time being disobedient to the pope or the bishops or a superior? Well, here, here's the thing. Here's how they're going to couch it. They're going to present the Missal of 62 as the preservation of the faith so that if one does not hand this down and pass it on, then they're failing in their duty as a Christian to pass on sacred tradition and pass on the faith. And so if we put it in those terms, one is going to say, well, you have to have the duty to preserve sacred tradition. And if you equate the Missal of 62 with sacred tradition and with the preservation of the faith, and if you believe the Missal of 69, the Novus Ordo, does not preserve the faith, then you're going to say, well, I'm just being obedient to my commission as a Christian to pass on the faith. But the error there, the underlying error, yeah, well, is to okay, so equate on, the Missal of 62 cause, cause, with the preservation of the faith. Yeah, if you hold on one second, Mike, because I want to I want to underline this, because that is an argument sure. that you hear all the time, that, mm -hmm. well, the Pope is wrong, and in what he is doing, he is attacking the church by attacking the TLM and attacking the faith. And there are many people in the church who buy into that position. Why is that position not correct, if you think it's not correct? Well, just to clarify, why is the position not correct that he is, he is not um, restricting the faith, that is, by restricting the TLM? Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I, I would say, as Pope Benedict noted in Summorum Pontificum, that the Missal of 69, the Novus Ordo, is the same Roman rite as the Missal of 62. And so, yes, it's true that the liturgy itself does is a vehicle for transmitting and carrying on the faith, but the Missal of 69 does that as well. And so for the Pope to say, well, I'm going to restrict the use of the Missal of 62 and um, require people to use in the Roman Rite the Missal of 69 in particular cases, that's not him saying, well, no, you're, you're no longer able to pass on the faith because one is certainly able to pass on the faith with a well-celebrated Novus Ordo. I, I, another point I'd like to bring in here is that it might seem a little far afield to Western Catholics' minds, but you know there are 21 other rites in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Many of them, you know, all, all of those sort of chase their history, trace their history back to St. John Chrysostom or St. Basil, which by far precedes anything we're talking about with regard to the traditional Latin Mass by a thousand years or more. Uh, you, you know, aren't isn't the whole sort of Eastern uh, uh, you know, family of the church, and I'm not talking about the Eastern Orthodox, I'm talking about Eastern rites in the church, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the Maronites, the Syrah Malabars, all of these. Sure. Uh, aren't they just sort of being bowled over and sort of thrown out to the, the side? And that roughly comprises about 10% of the church. Uh, and it seems to me this kind of almost blind obedience to the traditional Latin mass, as though you've made an idol out of the mass so that you can... Mm -hmm you know, proffer disobedience to the Pope and sort of deny the extent of his authority, uh, the reach of his authority, and then you just kind of sideline or ignore these rites over here. Remember, these rites, you know, if you've got the Novus Ordo and the traditional Latin Mass and then all these Eastern rites, and mm -hmm. the claim is made by the traditional, you know, kind of mad, rad, trad crowd that, uh, you know, the battle between these two is the TLM is far superior in grace or whatever, well, is the TLM also far superior to all of these other Eastern rites that, that predate it by a thousand years? But believe it or not, I've, I've heard uh, people make that claim. I call them Latin right supremacists. Uh, whereas the Second Vatican Council indicates otherwise, that all of the liturgical rites and uh, rites in the churches are of equal veneration. And so one is not greater than the other. Although we have seen um, periods in history where there has been a bias of one right over another. But again, the position of the church is no, absolutely not. They're all equally venerable. But you can find that attitude where some see the um, Roman right as supreme over other rights, unfortunately. Frankly, and, and God forbid that this would ever happen, but even if you had a disappearance of the Roman right today, you would still have a pr preservation passing on of the faith in all of the other rights. Sure. Yeah, there, there seems to be a woeful lack of, I mean, it seems to me this is almost an emotionalism that has taken over uh, with regard to, it's not that, the, it, and nobody's talking about, you know, horrible clown masses where there are abuses versus sure. 
the traditional Latin mass, like there's nothing in between. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, when I am free to, and I'm not on the road, I travel. I, I, I've been to many reverent, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Nova Sordo masses. Um, but of course, you know, there's many over here that will sort of say under their breath, well, that's not really valid or that's evil. The SSPX's mm. position is that's evil and you shouldn't mm. go to it if you can't go to the SSPX mass. Um, back to Bishop Schneider, because that's the point of this. It seems to me that this is an extremely, extremely dangerous position. You know, when mm. he says something, there are people that are, you know, various websites, I think people will know who I'm talking about, various websites that just pounce on it and put it out there and keep playing it and keep replaying mm. it and keep rebroadcasting it to cover their support for schism. This is schism. In principle, there's no difference here in what's being done, not what's being taught, but what's being done between the German synodal path of like, hey, you know, let's you know, marry gays and women priests and whatever, uh, and essentially giving Rome the finger, and Bishop Schneider sitting there saying, hey, priests, disobey the Pope, give Rome the finger. I mean, in principle, this is the same thing. It is. And, and you're right to note that this is um, schismatic in nature. And so that's the irony here under the guise of preserving tradition. Um, one is effectively calling for an act of schism because at the end of the day, according to canon law, schism is going to be defined as a submission of um, uh, to the authority of the Roman pontiff and those in communion with him, which would be the bishop. And so if the bishop and or the pope is doing something within their authority and requires one to uh, attend a particular liturgical form and restrict another, um, that's within their authority. If you disobey that, that is going to be schismatic in nature. That doesn't necessarily mean that a person is automatically excommunicated and they're formally a schismatic. No, there, there could be somebody who is materially in schism. They, they don't, they're not aware of it. But nonetheless, the act itself is still schismatic. Sure. Yeah, that's what John Paul said about Archbishop Lefebvre's consecration of the four bishops. The act is, it's just, he called it in his letter the next day, a schismatic act. And, uh, you know, three, again, three popes in a row, schism, schism, schism. I mean, there's no way around this. And that's specifically with regard to the SSPX. Do you think that, uh, you know, Bishop Schneider was sort of the liaison uh, between the Vatican and the SSPX? And of course, look, we know Bishop Schneider has great reverence for, you know, the, the, uh, the old rite and the tradition in the church and, you know, hates like all of us hate all this craziness and modernism and the whole bit and everything. Nobody's arguing about the reasons why. What everybody's saying who needs to say something here, including this bishop we got this comment from, and just in case somebody's joining late, this is from a bishop we got uh, about a half hour or an hour ago. He said, a bishop here in the United States, a sitting ordinary, said, Bishop Athanasius is not the supreme legislator. He may disagree, but that doesn't give him a right to advocate for disobedience. This really is disobedience. I mean, I don't, he, he said, I mean, the guy asked him, and he said, yeah, you should disobey the Pope. And Schneider said it. We, we just played it. Disobey the Pope, disobey the priests. Uh, very dangerous territory, Michael. Certainly, and, and it would be contrary to St. Thomas Aquinas's position, which would be that we are to obey prelates, even if they're wicked prelates. Not for the sake of their own self, because frankly, if they're wicked prelates, they don't have any personal merit, but we're to obey them because of their authority. And then the question is now going to be theological. Is it within the authority of the Pope to restrict the Missal of 62? The answer emphatically, according to Trent and Vatican I, is yes. yes. And also, Pius XII and Mediator Day confirms that. So frankly, underlying all this is a doctrinal error. Yeah, that's very good. Michael, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, got you on the phone there in kind of a flurry and said, hey, join us real quick for this live story. So I appreciate your time and your expertise and your knowledge base there. It's very helpful. Thank you very much. Michael Lofton, very well-known Catholic apologist. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. All right, we're going to wrap things up here with that one single point. This is disobedience, and it's not us saying it. You saw the video of Bishop Schneider himself saying uh, you know, be disobedient. The problem to be to priests, be disobedient to your bishop, be disobedient to your uh, to the pope. And if you get the opportunity to go buy whatever an old abandoned, you know, wrecked up church or something, buy it and go have your own masses over there. 
This is not the, the way Catholics respond to things. And again, just so everybody's clear, we have no beef with Bishop Schneider. We never have had. He's always been very friendly towards us. We've always been very friendly towards him. We've, we have done multiple interviews with him, which he's been gracious and kind enough uh, you know, to grant us. We sell his book, Dominus, Ace, uh, Dominus Est, in our bookstore here, in our church militant shop. Wonderful insights, very wonderful man, but he's wrong on this point and very dangerously wrong on this point. Heard Michael Lofton there, and it's not Michael Lofton. Michael Lofton's quoting from Trent. He's quoting from Vatican I, and even mentioned Pope Pius XII there as well. Does the Pope have the authority to change or alter or suppress or whatever a particular liturgy? Yes, he does, by his position as the supreme legislator. That's it. This is a yes or no question. And if the presumption, if the underlying presumption is that, well, the faith cannot be passed on unless it comes in the Latin Mass, that's a problem. Considering 98% of the Catholic world doesn't attend the Latin Mass, uh, well, that's a problem. What needs to happen is not the promotion of the Latin Mass for its own sake. It's a beautiful thing. I go to Latin Mass. This isn't a thing. I went to Latin Mass last Sunday. Uh, that's not the question. The question is this underlying attitude of disobedience of disobedience. You have to be obedient to uh, when, they exer when the authority that is being exercised is legitimate, you must be obedient to it. That's all there is to this. You may not like it. You can stay in the church and fight for it, for change. You can petition this. You can do that. We've been trying to do this for 17 years here at Church Milton with a number of successes along the way. But you don't get to walk out of the church because you have made the decision that you have greater authority than the Pope or the hierarchy when they are legitimately exercising their authority regardless of the state of their souls. So that's it for now. We will be following this story. We'll have some of it on Evening News, uh, Church Milton Evening News a little later uh, tonight. But uh, pray for the church and get in the fight. If you're Catholics and you care about this, get in the fight. Don't run out of the church thinking to yourself or being having people delude you into thinking you're saving the church. You don't save the church by running out of it. You save the church by staying in it and fighting for it. That's for all, that's all uh, we got for you right now. We will again be following this story very closely as we are certain it will be developing and mushrooming and carrying on because that's the nature of these sorts of things. In the meantime, thank you very much for tuning in and uh, please continue to keep us and our work here in your prayers. Thank you very much. God love you.